like another kid threw a coin at me and said, Dirty Jew, you know, Stingy Jew, pick up the coin. It was in the toilet like area and I wasn't going to pick it up. My guest today is Ellie Goldsmith, also known as the Midnight Rabbi. Ellie is a rabbi, podcaster, musician, and the brain behind Unity Bookings, a global entertainment promotion. Ellie, how are you doing? Doing good, man. Very nice to see you, Ellie. We're happy we share a good name. Yes, Ellie to Ellie. It's a pleasure to have you on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so first of all, um, as I mentioned, they call you the Midnight Rabbi, which is a very cool sort of alias. Uh, you sound like you belong in some sort of cowboy, Jewish cowboy film. Uh, what is that about? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, it's funny you said that cowboy, because when you write Midnight Rabbi, it always comes up first, Midnight Cowboy. So uh, Yeah, <laughs> very different film. Yeah. But if you write my my English name, Ellie Goldsmith, it does actually come up Midnight Rabbi. And the way I got the name was from the students themselves. And that for me is the biggest honor that I was out on the streets and you know, the at-risk community uh, late at night and being there with those boys, seeing them go through their struggles. And the boys themselves said, when they created an email for me, cause I was really offline in those days. We're talking about, you know, the uh, 2008, nine, 10, those kind of years. I, I was taking a break from being online and just focusing on uh, my spiritual journey and helping others in terms of teaching and that and creating events so I really wasn't on the online I had other people do it for me uh, but they decided to create an aim, email for me and they called it Midnight Rabbi that was uh, at Gmail or whatever I don't know if it still exists the actual email but the the name definitely exists and a lot of other uh, brands that came off it um, online but but why Midnight Rabbi because am I right in thinking that this has to do with um, that you would study at midnight that's the point yeah it was a yeah. late night shift and that was my insight to the world of you know at-risk teenagers in israel in jerusalem specifically i went to the head of the institutes and said look most of your kids are out on the street at midnight literally and that's where their main energy and life force is coming from and you all are not there and they you're all ready for them in the daytime, early in the morning, throughout the day. And I want to be the person to be there for them. They didn't have like counselors or, you know, like a, they call it Abbai in Hebrew, which means someone like who takes care of the uh, campus, a family kind of uh, employed for that purpose. But the missing point is there was no actual teachers or staff other than that limited you know skeleton crew and i felt that that was the best time to access these boys and it really became a, a success for those many years to the point where i even had some uh, interest from tel aviv and um high-tech you know entrepreneurs who want uh, social entrepreneurs who wanted to create it into like an official midnight rabbi position like the other people could be trained in now it didn't happen for whatever reason i think Madoff came along though during those years and made off with a lot of the uh, sponsorship and you know it was a little bit of a challenging time financially so I, I ended up just being a normal bloke and getting a job but um, up until then that was my ideal position because I what I did is I followed up in the afternoon with a music class and studio access so when they'd wake up again by you know four or five I was there till seven eight and then I'd go off again maybe sleep for an hour and come back at midnight and I was literally up all night. And some places I even traveled on the last bus um, just to be on their campus. And I was there till the first bus in the morning. Mm, my God. So so really, this, this goes um, beyond um, educating people. This actually sort of veers into maybe being some sort of a mentor and a counselor in some ways. Yeah, yeah, it really was. It, it was really with a mission that people, like I resonate with what you guys are doing, that there's a certain urgency and the street culture, if you don't get the attention you need, which unfortunately I, I've seen the results, you can end up, especially in the last few years, it's gone it's gone crazy, the uh, suicide rate and the overdose rate. Um, you know, the pandemic they talked about 
um, they didn't really name it right. I think it was a really a pandemic of opioids and other things that really was getting most of the uh, population, the mental health issues. So I knew that being there late at night for these kids who are away from home, this is where I need to be. And it was an idealistic uh, hope to save their lives. And many boys I'm still connected with, happily married, or even if they're still going through hard times, but they're still in touch. And uh, thank God I've had a lot of good news. And as we say in uh, Jewish, a lot of nachas. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I think that's uh, absolutely amazing work um, that, that you're doing in Israel. You're not actually uh, uh, from Israel. We're actually from the same place. We're both Ellie from Edgware. Um, yeah, yeah. What, was, what was life uh, like growing up for you there? Yeah, so I would never imagine this is what I would be doing, you know, that time of my life in my uh, mid-20s or something. I grew up in uh, late 20s. So I grew up in London, in Edgware, a North London boy and North West London, I'd add. Very nice. And, uh, you know, the Goldsmith family were pretty well known. And uh, thank God I had the good fortune, and we'll get into a little bit, I assume, but of being in like the uh, concert world, VIP, Royal Box. That was my upbringing, Live Aid already at five, six years old, sitting there seeing Prince Charles and, you know, Princess Diana, not a few few rows away from me and celebrating that day. My, it was actually my brother's bar mitzvah as well, I think. So it was wow. a very significant day in the Goldsmith family that, you know, my uncle had put it together with Bob Gelder for my father had done all the promotion. Um, both my brothers are now, you know, involved in the business and that they're carrying on my father's business. And uh, I thought I'd, on some level, continue that legacy here in Israel. But the idea of growing up in, uh, in Edgware, you know, North London, traditional Jew, didn't really understand what it meant to be Jewish, honestly. That was my big, big question that came on later on in life. And, uh, you know, I just was part of the crowd. I went to a state school. I was, you know, um, probably one of the only Jews in my year. And I think that was interesting, you know, divine providence that I had the blessing to meet all kinds of people and not be, you know, significantly, you know, inclined towards any culture, any people. And it gave me an open mindness, which is actually helped me a lot nowadays that I'm online on trying to um, you know educate and help and be involved with all kinds of people not just the Jewish people yeah you you mentioned that um, you know you, you attended sort of the, the local uh, state school and I also happen to know you know we, we've spoken a bit you've had your fair share of uh, unfortunately uh, nasty anti-semitic uh, experiences if you're comfortable doing so would you mind elaborating on that a bit yeah no I'm totally comfortable the uh, state school system, it was a blessing, as I said, because I got to meet all kinds of people and cultures and, you know, learn at the hard, you know, see really what people go through from the council estate to, you know, to kids who lived in nicer homes. I mean, even the kid that lived in the nicer home that I used to go visit, I funny enough went back for a Shabbat visit uh, with my wife's family and I was staying, they lived in his old house. And the police came, knocked on the door the one time I'm there for that one weekend and were looking for him. And because he hadn't been there for a bunch of years and they were chasing and he was from the best of homes. So uh, I can't imagine what happened to the rest of these guys. I mean, li literally, uh, it was rough and tough. And, you know, I, had, I got beaten up a few times for sure. Now, was it coming from an anti-Semitic place? Sometimes, yes. They, what was strange is I wasn't so aware. Like I'd come home and say to my mum, you know, boy told me I can't eat ham. And I'd be like, you know, am I not allowed to eat ham? She know you're Jewish, you don't eat ham. I was like, all right. So it was like pretty ignorant. But at the same time, like another kid threw a coin at me and said, dirty Jew, you know, stingy Jew, pick up the coin. It was in the toilet like area. And I wasn't going to pick it up, but he was just being rude. I funny enough noticed that boy years later, um, I actually went to one of his cousins home and he was there and I was a bit scared of him. And then later on, um, I saw him in Baskin Robbins beating up a lot of my friends and they all were obviously Jewish. So, you know, definitely there was there was that thread wow. and that wake up call. Wait a minute. Why is this happening? Why are they pointing me out? Like I was in Collindale Park one time with all my friends from school. And at that point, I was still very close with all my state school friends, uh, even though I transitioned to a private school, which, you know, gave me a lot sort of, uh, as they say, a little push up in terms of the system. And, uh, but I was still, you know, I was dressed maybe a bit nicer. Maybe I stood out in that sense, but uh, a whole group of other guys came and, and uh, with bricks and knives and basically threatened my friends. If they don't back off, they're going to do something to them. And they, they proceeded to beat me up like 
big time. So it was a little bit rough, you know, Edgware, Burnt Oak, Collindale, those kind of areas. Um, in those days, the council estate in Edgware was much, you know, different than it is now. When I go back to Edgware, it's all been, uh, you know, all the, I don't don't know all the right correct names, but they basically moved everything to a higher level in terms of standard and quality of building, and even the school Edgware schools and a whole nother level in terms of the investment they put into there. So. You know, I, I hope the people have been taken care of, but the uh, infrastructure looks like it's improved a lot. So, yeah, I mean, that must have been absolutely um, terrifying. Were you able to tell uh, teachers or people in positions of authority or anything? Yeah, that was interesting. I, you know, I was a teenager by that point, young teenager, and I just didn't look to authority as a as a place. You know, I did one time get mugged uh, where they I had a mug in David and they they put a cigarette. I'd hidden it when I saw them. And when I put the cigarette, almost they in, they saw me move it and they saw the gold. They ripped it off and I called the police. But that was probably one of the only times I ever called police on someone and they were all waiting outside the Camden police station to beat me up afterwards. So it was pretty scary what was going on and we had to identify them. And it wasn't the kind of thing I really wanted to go through on a nice Saturday afternoon of instead of being a nice uh, being in a shawl or doing something more Jewish. I was out there in Camden going through that kind of horrible experience. But um yeah, I think it was all wake-up calls, honestly. It kept pushing me and saying, why am I different? Why am I Jewish? What does this mean to me? And that became the big question. It was a life-changing question that, as you can see, you know, like even externally, I've gone on a journey. You know? Absolutely. And this is actually something I have uh, found to be a common theme through talking to people, that people will undergo um, anti-Semitic experiences and rather than make them want to be less Jewish, it actually pushes them towards Judaism, to questioning why this is happening and to thinking, OK, let's actually explore my identity a bit more, which is ironically the opposite of what anti-Semites want. Yeah, well, I would add on to that that the school system also helps, because if you go through all of history, I don't know if it's still the same, the curriculum, but when I was there, that was my favourite subject and I really took note of history. And uh, by the time we got to the, you know, the climax of the educational curriculum of history and A-levels, uh, what was the point after all of history went through, you know, the Greeks, the Romans, all the way through till, you know, Industrial Revolution, go through everything. And we're at the, you know, climax the, of my education in the English school system. And what's it talk about? The Holocaust. And, uh, you know, as a result of the Second World War and everything that went on. And that was my first time encountering my own people in history. And it was basically showing them to be very uh, weak and victimized. And it was a very like, you know, low part of our history, probably the lowest. And that was my introduction. Oh, here's my people in the history books. And this is what they, they're, they're going through. It was never discussion of the greatness of the Jewish people, what we contributed, you know, to society. There was never any mention of, you know, any of the biblical times when we had temples and had our own empire and had tremendous, you know, influence in the world throughout all of history. None of that was ever mentioned. Just this like nebby, you know, uh, subjugated people being bullied around and eventually killed in the millions. So that really uh, woke me up. Like, what, what am I? part of this people that have this interesting history that must be more to it than just you know because i saw in my own eyes how successful jewish people are um in london you know we were very much involved in you know the management side in the music world especially and seeing the success we've had in that and then you know you look around and you see you know every person in hollywood somewhere either is either jewish or you know, influenced by Jewish people, they go to bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, everybody knows we're around. And it uh, started to, you know, open up with that big question. Yeah, you you, you mentioned there, um, you know, you, you, you uh, I mean, Jews being successful in the music industry. And as you mentioned earlier, in, in the podcast, you come from a family of promoters, like notably, you are yeah. the son of the legendary Harvey Goldsmith, CBE, yeah. Yeah. huge, huge, um, uh, promoter for live events. But I just make a correction. Harvey is my uncle. He's my ah, dad. apologies. He's my dad's younger brother. My father, who stayed out of the limelight, but they worked together all that time as well, was Martin. And right. Martin it was the one doing all the merchandise, and you know he he was there just as much as Harvey. Just Harvey, that was his brand. You know, Harvey yeah. Goldsmith Entertainment. Whereas my father's event merchandising, which is a uh, he didn't put his name there. You know, yeah, it was a family-run. 
a yeah. family run thing, which I, I, I really like. Um, what what was that like for you growing up? Because you you must have rubbed shoulders with some pretty impressive figures. Yeah, so I'm I'm happy you mention it. Um, you know, it definitely gave me some popularity. Also, I've just you know made a list here just some of the names that I remember. Hacksaw Jim Duggan came to my bar mitzvah, which is very cool. Wow! I picked up my grandma, a little lady, a little <laughs> Jewish Polish, you know, I don't Polish, but a little Jewish lady on his shoulders and screaming USA. You know, <laughs> that was fun. I mean, I was a big Spurs fan, so I, I would have preferred a few Tottenham players, but my dad was in the business, so that's who he brought. And Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And then I went on a tour to uh to the US with them and Pittsburgh I was by uh a big WWF event back then so I got to meet them all I specifically remember that giant um sumo wrestler Yoko Omar Yokozuna Yokozuma that's it and uh you know my dad actually was quite close with Hulk Hogan he calls him his holy brother yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I, I myself am a big uh, fan of WWE and former yeah. WWF. Um, yeah. I'm incredibly uh, jealous that Hacks- Hacksaw Jim Duggan was at your uh, miss, but you must have been the most popular. Yeah, person. he's a really, really nice guy. Like, really, really, lo- they're all actually really lovely when you're with them. Um, they're all two, one or two psychos. I remember on that Pittsburgh <laughs> tour in America, one of the guys, I think the voodoo guy, went a bit nuts. So they had to sort of kick him out because he, was th- he wasn't just crazy in the ring. He was crazy outside as well. Right. And uh, one of the stories my dad told me that sumo guy, he got stuck in the toilet and the whole thing started breaking and it was a whole mess. You know, there's always big stories on the tours. And I grew up with those kind of stories because uh, it wasn't just the wrestling, it was the music world and hearing about Led Zeppelin, the Rolling Stones and, you know, the biggest acts around going backstage, VIP, meeting Eric Clapton and Slash and, you know, uh, Noam from Oasis in the 90s, you know, when there was the new generation of musicians and meeting all those guys and uh, working at those festivals. I worked at OzFest of Ozzy Osbourne and all those guys. Wow. And uh, it was, yeah, it was a very interesting, uh, profound experience, especially for a teenager who loved music so much. Yeah. And I felt very blessed in that way. And my friends appreciated it also. My God, you must have had some incredible experiences. I mean, Led Zeppelin, for God's sakes, what was that like? Well, Led Zeppelin, the way it worked out for me, I wasn't actually so into them, honestly. But um, there was a funny story that when they, made a reunion concert with them harvey and uh, was uh, i think a major point in bringing that together and my dad and harvey were the keys to getting the last remaining tickets so there was a nice guy out there in um, new york a guy called jeff palver who wanted to get a ticket and couldn't get them because they were sold out pretty much but through my family he tries luck he actually just brought black eyed peas to jerusalem for a, for a jerusalem rocks fence event so he was okay. trying my he'd heard about my family and uh, he, my dad pretty much said to him, you want to get to me, you got to go to meet my son when you're in Israel next. So he came to Israel, met with me in the old city, even though he wanted me to come to Tel Aviv. I said, I'm not doing that. So he came to the old city, literally handed me his credit card and said, what do you, I heard you work with these at-risk teenagers. And I, in the merit of Led Zeppelin, I ended up kitting out a full studio of music instruments and creating a concert that year that was about 900 kids and kept many of the kids off the streets because they used that studio equipment. And, you know, there's still some guy using it to teach drums. And unfortunately, a lot of it got ended up after a few years getting uh, nicked, as we say in England, by one of the kids who sold it for drugs. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to monitor all the equipment over the years. But initially, it was an amazing help and uh, created some great things. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, now, now you are yourself a musician, and I'm assuming all of these experiences when you were younger will have, will have influenced this in some way. I mean, you know, in your youth, you even won a competition or two. Who are you? <laughs> uh, that's how I do my research. Who are you yeah. a fan of musically? So, yeah, that competition was a good one. That ended up in the JC, of course. And of course. Uh, my, that, that crew of guys I'm still best friends with, and I was just at one of their weddings in Amsterdam. It was amazing. Um, uh, and I actually helped with the music there, funny enough. So there's a continuation in the story. But um, in terms of uh, who are my big influences, uh, back in the day, I would say all the legends, you know, like it's obvious, like people like Bob Marley and Jimi Hendrix. And uh, my dad was a big jazz hippie, so I got to hear all the greats in that sense, you know, from hearing like the top musicians in the world, like Eric Clapton. I met him and myself, but being able to, to, to go to his live events and sit in the Royal Box or Royal Albert Hall or anything like that, or wow. Lenny Kravitz and Jamiroquai, it, Stevie Wonder, it, everybody. I mean, I must have seen all the greats, Michael Jackson, Prince, you know, anybody and everyone, Guns N' Roses, I met Slash, got, you know, different 
they were all big influences. But during the 90s, I got really into the grunge movement and hip hop. You know, these were that was what was big then Beastie Boys and Snoop Dogg. And then that helped me get into the hip hop world, Tribe Called Quest. I started to, you know, refine my taste a little bit with the hip hop music. And um, in terms of the rock, you know, there's there's big stuff out there, you know, like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to go through who were my favorite, but I would say the top influence band on me in the 90s was Radiohead and Alice in Chains, I think those two. And um, I just think that Radiohead just opened my mind up. I mean, maybe I was doing a bit too much drugs in those days as well, <laughs> the combination, um, but it just opened up my mind to that there was a, something more to life than the nine to five, you know, yeah. uh, corporate job. And it made me start help in my search for more, for more meaning. Yeah, absolutely. And this this sort of search for me, in a way, it's a very sort of Jewish thing to search for more meaning, to want to know what else is out there, is it not? I think so. And I think that thankfully the Jewish world, you know, as with all the different criticisms, and I'd rather focus on the good, um, especially publicly, unless we want to do something that's practical about it. But on a, on, a, on a praise to us that we had all these tours that everyone went on around 16. And that made a profound effect to me because I'd never been to Israel, never been to the Holy Land. And coming here at 16 was like, wow. And I came away with like this feeling like I was missing something. I felt empty when I came back. I didn't feel like I was really fully home once I'd gone there. At first, I thought it's because it was the whole social vibe and, you know, the whole energy of being on tour. But I think inside I knew that I was missing something. I wasn't there anymore. And I made it back there uh, during my university days. And I really was there now to search. Yeah. Yeah. Now, listen, you want to talk about the, uh, the power of music. We both know that there are artists out there right now who are actually fighting anti-Semitism through their art. For example, the uh, rapper Westside Gravy, who you know, he raps about anti-Semitic tropes in a very clever, effective way. There's the also not a musician, but the comedian and former podcast guest Elon Gold, who uses his comedy <laughs> as a vehicle yeah. to bring attention to neo-Nazis in the United States. I just love it when artists um, of any genre use their uh, talent to, ta to, to raise awareness of this issue. Um, do you think art and entertainment uh, can be used as an effective way to combat anti-Semitism? Yeah. Saving lives, that's what it is, really. And, you know, so you say you take that festival, the Comedy Chosen Fest, you know, we have Elon Gold there and, you know, Modi and other guys. And then Nissan Black, thank God, was booked there. We're not ex directly through it, I was involved in it. And then um, wrote Moshe Rubin, who was your past guest, also amazing episode here alongside Elon Gold as well. That's actually what, you know, really, I was like, wow, this is a serious podcast. So, but. I have to introduce my people to this, but I, you know, always looking for good content online and it's so important and you're doing that. And that that's what opens me up to want to, you know, want to really push for good quality media and art, music, creative energy. We have it in us and there are loads and loads of youth. My original concept was music for the youth. Like we have to create a youth movement in the Jewish world and empower musicians and creative avenues and not just leave it to you know the the general music industry we have to have a little bit more control like you know independence so that they don't end up you know in a not good situation from the music industry influence um either financially or drug wise like we want to protect our own people make sure they're in a good place so that's obviously at the top of the list you know we've seen that the music industry does destroy its own stars unfortunately um and that's something which I was very concerned about. And I was very happy to hear recently one of, uh, on a visit, a group of people came to my uh, current work right now and they were all in, you know, the uh, top LA uh, scene. And I've been, you know, speaking with them actually since then. And one of the points they mentioned that they actually now have a movement of concern and bunch of management and the industry to actually look after the musicians, which you think would be obvious. And but if you look at you know the recent Elvis movie, it was not obvious, yeah. And that's just one example of many where the management, the main concern in the management, like my dad used to tell me, was making sure they had their their hit of drugs that's what he needed to take care of, you know, wow. and not really giving them the tools to be role models, to live a healthy lifestyle, um, and to, to be people that you'd look up to, and that's where we can really make a difference. If we have those kind of personalities taken care of and given the correct guidance in terms of lifestyle, then 
with the talent and the creative flow. And, you know, Joe Rogan always makes a point, I listen to his podcast a lot, that, you know, the drugs and the vibe, the whole lifestyle is part of the whole creative, you know, energy. And there is something to that. I'm not going to deny it. But I would suggest that, you know, we can do better than that, you know, as a Jewish people in terms of having a standard and not just doing whatever we feel like. And then from that sort of endless, you know, overflowing creative vibe, produce amazing art. It can also come with a very, you know, focused a way of living that doesn't have to deny the creative flow. Absolutely. I completely agree. And we are definitely seeing that in this new generation of proud Jewish artists. I mean, you've named Nissan Black. Um, there's Moshe Rubin, of course, Westside Gravy. There's Kosher Dills. Like all of these new young uh, Jewish artists who actually have quite a, a wholesome image as well without sort of being lame about it, which I think is some of the concern about those people who say it's about the drugs, it's about the vibe, and without that, what is there? It's like, no, there's actually this new generation who connect with the youth, it's plain to see, and they're proud about being Jewish, and they, don't, and they do speak out about anti-Semitism, and it's very effective. Yeah, I agree. And I think that the more we give tools and strengthen that side of the industry in terms of our own people investing in it, we can really make a difference. You know, if I had ability, I would be doing large scale events already. My dream was to do a unity concert in the whole world. And the way we do unity events would create a platform for everybody to perform globally, like what happened in Live Aid um, through the streaming tools they had in those days, satellite, etc. Nowadays it would be much easier to, to do that, um, I don't I don't even know if we'd have to concord Phil Collins. I think we could figure out even quicker ways of getting uh, everybody connected. And you know, it's it's a different world we're in, and the opportunity is there. Um, obviously, the the technology is still not at the level of in person experience, but it is a work in process. Um, so I do still have a vision of creating a global unity concert. And if anyone would have an issue with it that would show their lack of a unity. They would just show who they are. So uh, that would be the solution to the ones who would be against it. Just Definitely. I mean, let's get on to that. You, you, you are the man behind Unity Inspires projects, which is really sort of an umbrella for a bunch of uh, individual projects as well. You have promotions, but you also have a podcaster, and that comes under it. Can you talk us a bit about what inspired Unity Inspires? Yeah, great. I'm happy you, you went to this um, because... For me, this is what my passion is because it's been a journey. And I, I had a vision when I was in a student in the university in Sussex, running along the beach there in Brighton. I used to go jogging a lot. You know, you wouldn't imagine that. She pretty good shape <laughs> back then. And um, I was running along and I had a vision of unity, of people together with light and positive and love. I, and I wasn't on any drugs. I'd actually quit drugs by that point, made a decision and, you know, a certain decision. Thankfully, what happened, I lived with a dealer. So he sort of, it was either all or nothing. So I just decided nothing. And I got into very healthy, I mean, it went together with my Sabbath or Shabbat of observance as well, sort of went together because then it showed I had the ability to say no to cigarettes and other things. And uh, that running along I had this vision of unity. And it was very much connected with my journey to Israel that I soon took and had already taken at the beginning of the year in university. And I just knew that there was this mission that we have on a soul level, that it's not enough just to for us to become the best people we can be, but we need to also unify with the rest of the world in some way or form. And one of the ways to do that is through music and art and creative platforms it it's a sort of a level of communication that surpasses you know what general media is busy with which is the word form or you know you know newspaper that back in those days nowadays i suppose it would be uh you know twitter which is a complete nightmare um for unity and other such platforms the social media platforms so or tiktok or something like that they're not really leading towards a unified path for humanity and therefore since there's such a divisive dystopian you know degeneration going on right now you would just listen to you know russell brand or anyone discussing you know every single episode what the f is going on like every single it's, like, <laughs> it's gone it's gone nuts so if yeah. that is where the world's generally heading right now as a as a discussion and a focus so we have to obviously as always all revolutionaries and i consider myself one we have to, from the Jewish world, really 
revolutionize our focus in music and entertainment and unity and it's something which is all connected the culture wars is where it's at and we have to help the youth open up when i was developing myself it was during those years through music and the voice of the musicians had a big influence on me and i think that the nowadays it's just even more so that once you've got your following you know an example like nf if you've ever heard of him a rapper yeah current we're talking about someone current now yeah so he doesn't swear great amazing doesn't use any bad language and yet he's a top level hip-hop artist and you know i believe he's on like similar levels to eminem and in terms of quality um check him out nf and you know his performance is amazing as well i haven't seen him live but from what i've seen another example 21 pilots no swearing no like focus on so they obviously have something spiritual, even though I don't know this band that well, not 21 Pilots, and I'm a big fan of, but there's my kids even introduced. I always like to listen to what the kids are. We're just in a car. We took some girls uh, back from a place we stayed the Sabbath. And I asked the girls, what are you into? It's important to hear from the kids themselves. What are they into? Um, and that band, I uh, believe, uh, Dragon something, what's it called? Oh, Imagine uh, Dragons. Ma- yeah. So th- th- that band, for example, also the guy has some sort of principles and values, you know, he's, I don't think he's religious or anything, but just he has some principles. And that for me shows that there's hope in the music world to influence the culture. So to come back to me, Unity Inspires projects, what the concept of Unity Inspires is that unity is the idea that that's the ideal. Inspiration is how we're going to do it. And the projects are just the practical ways of making it happen. Yeah, so the inspiration is what's going to make the change, but it's got to come from a, perp- a source of unity. And this really is a deep concept. It really goes into the idea of mind or thought, speech and action. The idea of unity inspires projects. That's the theme behind it. So I wrote a book called United Souls just to explain it. And United Souls really, the goal would be to have many other authors and all these wonderful people you mentioned before and all those other influencers out there, also speakers. I've worked with speakers as well. Um, Moshe Gersh and, uh, you know, um, Rudy Rochman and Shloy Museum. You also hear from them themselves how as speaking as well in a way that's communicative and allows for unity. For example, Shloy Museum has made a lot of uh, unity in the Arab world with the Jewish world because he goes to the Arab countries. And then Rudy Rochman is able to go talk to anyone, doesn't matter who, and op- open their mind up, even a neo-Nazi or be able to break through a little bit and show them that there's some sort of errors in their thinking and their, the way they understand history. It has such a tremendous power to do that. Such such a wealth of talent going on right now. It's so uh, inspiring to see. I actually want to go back to something that you touched upon earlier, which is uh, you are a, uh, a member of the Breslov branch of Judaism. You're a follower of the Breslov branch of Judaism. Um, and I, I want to talk about this. If for those who don't know, Breslov is a, a branch of Hasidic Judaism, a movement inspired by the teachings of uh, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with this, what are some of the customs of this movement? And also, am I right in thinking that you came to this a bit later in life? You didn't necessarily grow up in this movement. Yeah, so obviously growing up in North London, you know, it was United Shul or Reform. Yeah. You know, that was far from Breslov. But the point um, coming to Israel, I actually went to more what they call yeshivish yeshiva. And while I was there, I was learning Chabad and um, Brezel. And my experience in university, I have to give a shout out to the Chabad rabbi there. If it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't have got connected because they're on campus providing a service. He actually really wasn't so on campus. He lived next to Chris Eubank, funny enough. And I ended up <laughs> going going there for Shabbos. And I was like, Chris. And he was like, all right, mate. And I was like, you want to come around for a bill? And they, they, they wanted to bring him around. They actually had a spare chair, but he was like, no, I'm busy. He was polishing his truck, literally. Wow. He looked, you know, great. Anyway, and we were like in Shabbat mode. But I met this rabbi in university. It was right next to my where I was staying on the beach. I decided to be by the beach. I was looking at a more spiritual place. And I didn't want to be on the campus of everyone else. So I managed to find a place. Um, find out my best friend who I went to the wedding in Amsterdam. It was his hookup got me that place. So everything flows. But the point was, to get back to your question, so that is part of it. It was going into the flow, trying to find that deeper path than the yeshiva shapath. The yeshiva path was amazing, and I got a lot from it. But learning Chabad and Breslov, for me, was really where it was at in terms of the feeding the soul. Um, I still feel, thank God, that 
being someone from outside, I didn't grow up with any specific path, that gives me an advantage to be able to absorb all the paths. So to be described as a breast lover, I don't think I reached that status in, in the world here of being officially recognized as a breast of rabbi or breast of teacher, even though I work for them and I encourage their teachings. I think they're very helpful. Um, I have my own rabbi who's the Tolna Rebbe, who's actually, in, interestingly, if you trace it back, he goes back to Chernobyl, which were actually against breast love. So in his shul, they don't have any of the breast of the books in the shul. But um, for me, it obviously makes no difference. And whenever I ask him, I'm going to Uman this year for Rosh Hashanah, he'll go, go with a blessing. It, just even though it's not his path, but he always blessed me to go and work with that path as well. I just feel that the, the, the light of what I'm trying to do in terms of the Unity Projects, it does align very well with Brezov and Chabad teachings. And now the general Jewish world is waking up very much in terms of the importance of outreach and connecting to the larger world. And so that's also influenced them as well, I think, to become more open-minded artists like Nissim Black, who he himself is a Brezlover. Um, so let's just get into a few ideas of Brezlov just while we're here. Please. So for example, Nissim Black, who got me to come for my first trip to Uman. So that's a very big part of the Brezlov mindset to go visit Uman, Rosh Hashanah. Um, right now, there's a lot of controversy going on because of what's going on in the Ukraine, Uman, Ukraine. And um, it's obviously a lot of you know, re recommendation not to go, but there's such hardcore uh, Hasidim uh, followers that the rabbi said, you go there, you've got more to be afraid of not coming, so they go. And um, Nissen Black got me there my first year, and then slowly I started working for the rabbi, so I was there with him, part of his institute. Um, but the concept of going to the Rebbe, Rebbe Nachman, was his you know, his big eight, so that it's a big advice to fix up the whole year by being by his graveside in Uman. So they endeavor to be there. And sometimes there's thousands and thousands before Corona. I think it was coming up to 100,000. Another concept of Breslov is that's relevant for everybody is the idea of talking to God, which is what we were talking about with Amuna, is having that relationship with God, which I think everyone in the world nowadays can get inspiration. You know, the whole addiction world, the 12 step movement. Everybody knows that, you know, in order to really overcome these addictions, you need to have a higher force, a higher power. You call it what you want. But the point is you have to connect to something beyond yourself to be able to overcome the addictions that are so powerful. And uh, that that is a very truthful reality of hum human existence. And people being able to communicate to that higher power gives them energy and focus and you know, abilities to do things they wouldn't be able to do. So Amuna is really where it's at. It teaches us to do that on a daily level for an hour a day if possible or whatever amount of time. The main thing is you're doing it daily, talking to God as part of your daily life, not just the prayer service, but as extra. Um, another concept of midnight, midnight rabbi, you call me, but there's also the idea of midnight prayers to pray at that time of will where things are different in the world. They're meant to be more at peace, even though they're not nowadays. But the concept of praying at those more holier moments, also mikvah, going into a place of purity, of, of waters that purify you. These are the kinds of customs that they took on. The main point is it's much to do with inner work. It's not mm -hmm. to do with trying to change the world. Chabad is a different kind of vibe. As you know, I'm sure everyone knows who Chabad is. Uh, you know, they made a joke that when people start to populate Mars, Chabad will also build a house there. So, <laughs> you know, that's part. Chabad is everywhere. So uh, yeah. We've got, we've got to go with that one. Um, but, you know, for me, the concept is the the ideas behind Chabad of the Rebbe and his ability to influence the world and build leaders like he did, like Rabbi Sachs, and the many, many thousands of Chabad people out there who are leaders in their communities and changing the communities. Whenever we travel, Nis and Black, one of the first things we're going to get is a Chabad rabbi hosting us or, and not just like whatever hosting, like amazing hosting of love and bringing us into their community and giving us opportunity to connect with their people. And if it's become, you know, you have the idea of a tour circuit. So you have all the major promoters. So I would say in the Jewish world, Chabad is like the, the kings of the tour circuit for the Jewish world. Wow. You know, I, I, I want to go back to something you, you mentioned. Um, one of the concepts of Breslov is Amuna. And you said that if, if you know, to spend an hour a day um, carrying this out, what does that look like? Would that be, a, would, would people, could, have, could they relate that to meditation? Is it more prayer based? What does that look like? Well, I think those kind of questions are going to be amazing to ask someone like Nissen Black because he's really uh, a big spokes, spokesman on this 
concept. Um, I present it. I'm an MC for it in terms of bringing those kind of personalities, but I don't feel comfortable because I, I, once again, as I said, I'm very varied in my approach to Judaism and I don't feel comfortable um, pushing it like as the path um, or living it up to it, what the rabbi is asking. So, um, but it definitely, what it does do is it centers you every day. It impacts your life with serenity. It gives you tranquility because you cleanse yourself an hour a day. Not only do you go through all the things you need to clean off, but you also now hand your life over to a bigger force. So you're not in control. And that, it takes, I mean, the whole anxiety, the world of anxiety nowadays and mental illness would in itself have, you know, obviously there's going to need professionals, et cetera, et cetera. But it in itself is a massive tool to relieve a lot of the tendencies towards that through people learning and developing a relationship with themselves and a higher force that they don't need to control the world around them that the world itself will go to where it needs to go you need to do what you need to do and that's by turning to the higher force and tuning into your real essence and then you can do that mission in the world once you're tuned into that inner part of yourself the way i would discuss it personally without quoting others is the concept of soul you have to tune more into the soul level um, that's my focus, um, United Soul concept. That we are all souls. We need to unify as souls. We need to learn the language of the soul. And one of those ways is through the meditation and the Muna Hispodidus process of talking to God. Mm. Wow, that's such an interesting sort of holistic uh, way of looking at things. Um, would you say there are any um, challenges that your community is facing right now? And if so, what, what needs to be done about them? Yeah, so challenge-wise, um, you know, it's not really my position once again to discuss the problems in the Jewish world because there definitely are. It's pretty, you know, the media do a great job finding all that stuff. Um, yeah. You know, it's pretty much, you know, already been said. Um, what what I would say is that rather we have to, as a people, be more proactive and dealing with solutions to those clear issues. Um, one of them, obviously, is building better financial systems to help the larger uh, infrastructure work better and more honest and more straight. And one of the things is, once again, to bring those values of the soul, which is what where, where do all the values come? I'd love to say that. Like, I'd love to get on Joe Rogan's pod and say to him, mate, you always talk about how much you love all your fellow comedians and you give them platform and you do all these amazing things for all these people. But where does it come from? And I'll say, oh, you know, I just love people. Where does love come from? Where do these feelings of need to connect to another person come from? And that is the soul level. That is the soul level that the world is not really discussing. And one of the points that I want to do on a global level and really work hard on, get get very much a viral concept, is hashtag anti-soulism. There already is anti-Semitism. That you go, you, you trend, go on tr- Twitter, trending is anti-Semitism almost every day. And then that's where you guys are. Anti-soulism, the idea of the soul level is something which we have to focus in on as a people. And the more we do, the more we go into the inner aspect of who we are as people and music, where does it come from, the soul and the creative aspects and the art and all these talented speakers, they're speaking from the soul. That's why they're so meaningful. Once we start to source it in that level, then we start to understand, wait a minute, we're not just human, like physical, we're not just emotional, we're spiritual. And that will change everything. For example, the technological revolution going on right now. They have no answers. There's Tristan Harris trying this, you know, humane technology and the social dilemma. And they're trying to fight with this overwhelming, increased social media experience. And they don't know how to deal with it. It's affecting kids on mass, mass suicide. Like, it's not just like a small issue. It's a massive issue. It's affecting, you know, body uh, esteem. And on every single level of society, people are affected now by this technological we're all attached to our phones and what's next. So I'm trying to at least create much more of an awareness. And I know, thank God, there are amazing rabbis and teachers and Rebbersons and all kinds of people like yourself who are a little bit more searching or maybe in a big way searching or in their lifestyle, like we said, Chabad, every day bringing the soul to their community, putting their soul out there, show expressing the soul without getting into any of the political stuff, just on a daily individual level, all of us can be more soulful. 
more kind, more loving. These are all aspects of the soul. If you can sort of just give, and I'm not asking you as a representative of Breslov Judaism, just as you, Ellie Goldsmith, if you can, if you can yeah. give... Uh, Appreciate that. I, I don't feel I'm worthy of Breslov Judaism anyway. Like I, I'm part of it, but not, you know mm. what I mean? It, how, can, can you give like one tip for, for how people can be more soulful in their day-to-day -day lives so they can apply? Yeah, I think one, it's very cool to just get out of the labels of society that in itself would just do us all a good job. Try to just really like tune into the fact that you're a soul. Once again, you mentioned about prayer service. I think prayer is a very important thing. Meditation, mindfulness, how, whatever way you call it. I think acting more godly, becoming more godly, thinking about being aware that you have an influence in your life and what you do influences the people around you and therefore you should try and make it the most positive influence and the most uplifting influence. You should try, as hum humankind can, but like in a real way, in a, in a daily way, to be a nicer father in my, set, in my situation, a nicer husband, a more caring, more empathetic, you know. There is enough wisdom, enough good people out there, enough good voices, like, you go through your podcast list of who you listen to. Make sure they're good influences. If they're not, filter them. If they're a bit, you know, risque, work out how to tune into the good parts of them. Same with the, all the YouTube stuff. Same with all the Netflix, if you waste your time on that. Whatever it may be, don't waste your time on it. Live a bit more active life and less online. You know, like try to filter out all the noise and all the nonsense and all the distraction tune into a more soulful experience of life, a more meaningful experience of life. And if you look at the really, truly successful people out there, they're doing it. Whether they're doing it in the name of religion doesn't make a difference. They're doing it. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, which I ask all of our guests, which is, um, if someone says to you, look, I don't know loads about anti-Semitism. I don't even know loads about Judaism, but I want to help in the fight against anti-Semitism. What can I do? Well, I think um, one of the things that people need to do more daily is share this kind of content it upsets me i spend hours every week putting out content and i see one or two good people take the time to share it majority are scared to share it not just that they're scared to like it they're scared to even comment on it even have it near them that is a problem we need to be able to say look i don't always have time to create this content like our friend ellie here and myself and other people you know, I've made time to create this content. That means I made an active choice to not maybe work in a normal company to do this. Not everyone has that ability. Okay, so therefore, when they what they do have is they have, as Stephen Kobe wisely talked about, their sphere of influence. And that sphere of influence, they can impact through liking, sharing, um, putting, introducing to others, talking about it themselves, once in a while, even being having the courage to even make a life. It's so easy now. Just pick up a phone and make a little little uh, blurb about what you feel about this situation. For us to just be passive is a massive mistake. The Lubavitch Rebbe said you have to be an active participant in life. You can't just watch. You can't just be constantly taking in content or like consumers. It's a whole consumer culture. We have to change the culture. This is the culture wars. And we have to start becoming active. It doesn't matter. Jewish, not Jewish. It doesn't make any difference. The point is there has to be activism of people who are bringing soul concepts to the world and healthy lifestyles. It has to be done proactively. It has to start becoming impacting the business level, impacting the relationship. And that means each of us individually every day practically need to like and share a few times a day something of meaning and purpose that can bring some light to the internet experience, to your WhatsApp group, to your TikTok flow. Yeah, I personally, when I go to TikTok, I don't even go on it. I just put content on there. I don't even want to go on it because the second I'm on it, usually it's 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 craziness yeah here and there thank god that my feed is actually pretty decent but you know you can create your feeds a little bit but sometimes with tiktok it's like it's just out of your control so just become more of an influencer and less of a consumer give over more you listen when you when you're listening listen but you have to be able to listen to the other side and be able to see the bigger picture but it's, the point is that you have to also when you're listening become an active listener where it actually affects you and brings about positive change that's the point that was the idea unity inspires projects the thought the, the ideal of unity that humankind should be unified united souls speak it out make it into reality 
get everyone in, into the concept of unity and build projects, build concerts, events, podcasts, media apps, everything, whatever you can do online to change the culture that people, the new generation are being brought up with an opportunity to become soulful people, even with technology. Mm. Ellie, before I let you go, please tell the listeners, where can people find you? So I'm at Unity Inspires Projects, very easy way to remember. It's on Instagram. It's still a pretty new page, so it needs a lot more following and sharing. And it's, you know, it's, it, I would love it to get unstuck in terms of its uh, um, ability to affect people. You know, all the musicians I work with, I'm connected with, like on their platforms here and there, they'll share my stories or whatever on our Instagram. Um, it's very likely I'll be again on tour with Nissim. Our last Hanukkah was in uh, the UK with Nissim in Manchester, London. I'm um, easy to find online. Just write Ellie Goldson, Midnight Rabbi, and all the different platforms. I'm pretty active on everywhere. I believe we have to be. And as I said, it's a matter of now, people like us doing this work, we need everyone else to to make it grow, to expand it. And that's so it's up to you guys listening to make it happen. Definitely. Ellie Goldsmith, The Midnight Rabbi. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. on Podcast Against Antisemitism. Pleasure. It should be successful. Campaign and Against Antisemitism, and you specifically, should be successful. And we should see a change in the discussion online towards the good.